And we're going to talk about Jericho today. Joshua fought the bottle of, battle of Jericho. I got some slides for you. Are you ready? Who's back there? We got, we got Rick's back there. Uh, was it Wednesday night that everything blew up? <laughs> Boy, you should see what these guys do. Hey, by the way, here's Jericho. Uh, kind of not a fancy spot to vacation as a rule. Uh, but this is Jericho. Did you know that Jericho, because it's situated um, on a series of of uh, springs. There's some, a lot of volcanic activity in this part of, the, part of the Middle East. And because of that, there's lots of broken open, fractured spots in the bedrock where water comes out in quite abundance. So Jericho, that big hill you see there, the basic hill has been there forever. And because of all the springs nearby and the many palm trees and what have you, it's a great place to live. Now, I want you to notice that at the bottom middle portion of the slide, there's a cut that goes into this tell or this hill. And you guys know the story, the Bible story. You had a flannel graph all about it, uh, that they marched around this city, the city, and at the time, it didn't look a lot different than this, other than the buildings that were on the top. And to walk around that takes about 25 to 30 minutes to walk around that entire sort of lump or that hill. And so um, you know the story that the walls came down. You probably had in your mind's eye a picture of a plane of some kind and, and, then, and then thrusting up through the, the horizontal earth, then you probably saw in your mind's eye a wall and then you sort of uh, pictured as your teacher told about the walls coming down that they sort of just fell down and seemingly with no impetus other than the Lord God himself. I'm gonna take you through this exercise uh, that's kind of fun. Uh, forgive me, but, but my geek quotient will peek out here just a bit. You guys all right with that? <laughs> Thank you for the all right. Some of you are going, oh, here he goes again with the history. All right, go to our next slide. Here's an artist's rendition uh, based on the, the archaeology that's been done. They started digging into that hill in the 1830s, and then the German archaeologists went over it pretty well. And then in 1930s, a guy by the name of John Garstang from the British Museum did the first real deep sort of excavations. And then to the middle and left of your screen there, he dug down um, quite a ways and he found a bunch of stuff. And he found a uh, basis for these walls and what have you. Then the next biggest one was uh, British archaeologist Kathleen Kenyon. And about 1952 to 1958, she did a big trench from the lower level that she called it the, rev, the revment, which is a kind of a retaining wall there at the bottom. And then the architects of that day, they filled in that in with dirt and so on. So she went right through there to the mid portion of the city. Now, Dr. Garstan, because of pottery that was found there, he estimated, and oh, by the way, uh, he found layer and layer and layer of civilization, and he found one very strong layer of charred remnants. It would seem that at one point, the entire city was set to blaze and was, uh, was destroyed. And so they were looking for evidence about the walls falling down, and Mr. Garstang found plenty, mud bricks piled up in a heap. And because of the pottery and such that they found, they were able to date it to what's called the Late Bronze Age. I'm so sorry, but I love this stuff. The Late Bronze Age, and you know what? That's about the time of Joshua. So Garstang said, you know what? This is true. It's about that time that the city saw a significant destruction. Then Kathleen Kenyon in the 50s came along. and She says, I think I'm smarter than that. She dated it um, earlier and, and said, you know what, uh, there was no city of Jericho at the time of Joshua, about 1400 BC. There wasn't even a city here then. And because she was very exacting in her uh, uh, un, unearthing one layer at another, and she was a very good author, it's the Kenyan sort of model that mostly is what you'll hear in colleges today. So don't be surprised if you pick up a, a history book or even look at Wikipedia and you're going to find out that the preponderance of most scholars believe the Bible's not true, that the Battle of Jericho couldn't have happened because there was no Jericho at the time of the uh, people coming into the Promised Land, and most of that is based on Kathleen Kenyon. Garstang, of course, dated it at such a time, no, no. 
Well, then what happens is in the year 2000, 1997 to 2000, Nicolo Marchetti, Papa Hey, he's from the University of Bologna. Bologna. <laughs> my, 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 Bologna. Dude, I, I don't know where that comes from. I'm so sorry. He did, a, uh, he did an excavation, and then he did his excavation from the bottom of the hill where that retaining wall is, uh, something that Kenyon called the revetment, and he dug from there all the way to the center. And a fascinating thing is, toward the bottom would be our right-hand uh, bottom corner. He found that that revetment wall, which is the retaining wall, cut right through. There was houses below, and then they found that the that the uh, old the houses were older, and that that revetment wall, that retaining wall, uh, went. They had to take those people out. They lost their houses. What do they call that? Um, uh, eminent domain. And so they had to leave, and then they built their thing, their revenant wall, right through it. When they got down and dug below the revenant wall on that little valley kind of in the forefront, they found a lots of things, and one of them was a series of scarabs. You know what a scarab is? It's a model of a beetle. And because that was some kind of currency that you could use for value, on the back of them and sometimes on the front were the names of Egyptian pharaohs of the day. I guess you'd call it trading cards, pharaoh trading cards. And because of what they found uh, below the revenant, that's when Nicolo Marchetti said, you know what? Turns out that John Garstang was correct. And Mrs. Kenyon is incorrect. Because of what they found, they knew the approximate time when Jericho had been burned to its foundation. And guess what? They said it and called it correctly in the year 1406. He dates it B.C. There, of course, then would account for the Battle of Jericho. Now, what about those walls falling down? Uh, let me take you through. Go ahead to the next slide. Here is what Mr. Marchetti, what he found out. He found out that on the bottom of the slope, there had been erected that retaining wall, which you saw a picture of there in the first slide. And behind that first retaining wall, then they filled in with an embankment and uh, made a cushion of sorts. And then another foundation is behind that. And there were two walls, two walls. Uh, the scale of the gentleman at the bottom is maybe just a touch big. But you'll see if you're standing below the, the retaining wall, you look up at the retaining wall. And the retaining wall uh, in many places was 18 feet high. And then on top of the retaining wall, there is your mud brick that they estimate went another sub couple of feet above that. The total at the bottom looking up, you would have been looking up at approximately 23 feet of wall above you. And as I said, because it was on that hill, it was an impenetrable city. And so what about the walls falling down? Here's what happened. Now hit our down arrow. There we go. Um, do you notice that uh, the upper wall, that's where the uh, Collin Ranch people lived, if you live in Collin Ranch. <laughs> that's, where the, that's where they lived, you know, uh, the, um, uh, all, the, uh, all the people that had anything. And then below, between the two walls, there was another group of houses. This was sort of the low-rent district. And based on pottery that's been found around the area, it was at the north end of these between the walls that likely the poorest of the people lived. And once again, archaeology has substantiated your Bible. The Bible says that Rahab in Joshua lived on the wall. And we don't read Hebrew as a rule. And if you break that down, the better word other than live on the wall, she lived against the wall. She had one of the walls of her house was this wall here. And then see down at the bottom sort of third, you see those two big windows? She probably had a window through the wall and then that's where she let down the two spies from, uh, from Moses' group. Now what happened when the walls came down, and here's another thing that the 1097 uh, and 2000 excavation uncovered, that the entire basis for those foundational walls was shifted and tilted outward. Remember how I said there's significant uh, volcanic activity that's going on here? Did you know that the Bible says when Joshua was about to enter the promised land, something bizarre happened. 
How are we going to get across the Jordan? It's in flood stage, harvest time. It's about a mile across. There's no way we're going to get across here. God says, put the Ark of the Covenant on the shoulders of the priests and have them step into the water. That's a lot of faith. Uh, I like the first one, the Red Sea. Part it, then I step. But that's a picture of you're saved. You're baptized in what color was that sea? The Red Sea. It's a picture when I get saved. It's a picture of baptism into and unto salvation. The second baptism that they had to pass through some water was under Joshua. Joshua is how you say it in Greek. How do you say Yahshua? I just said it in Hebrew. <laughs> Yahshua. How do you say Yahshua in Greek New Testament? Jesus. Did you know there's a Bible? There's a book of the Bible in your Bible that's lay, that's there's a book in your Bible labeled Jesus. Just saying. The second baptism is a picture not into salvation, so to speak, because they're going to go into the promised land. Now, the promised land is not a model of heaven because heaven, you don't fight anymore. Did Joshua, Jesus, and his troops have to fight? It's a picture of the spirit-filled life. God went before them and they broke the back of the Canaanites who lived there. Who remembers what the very first city that they encountered was called? Jericho. It's the first one. And something interesting. When you take this mighty city, and it was rich, by the way, because of all of the crops around there. And in Jesus' day, it was exceptionally wealthy because it was a border town. And then coming into the land of Israel, you had to stop at Zacchaeus' tax booth, and then you had to convert your currency and pay your taxes, plus all the rich agriculture that was there. It was a wealthy city, wealthy city indeed. But back to the battle of Joshua. It has always been a wealthy and well-to-do city. And that tell with those walls made for a great defensive mechanism until there is a shifting in the earth. The Bible makes mention that the waters that parted for Joshua, that baptism is a picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But back to Joshua, the Bible says that the waters piled up at a place called Adam. And you, it gives another name of the city there. Well, if you go there even to this day, it's several, it's a mile or so up the river. And then there, the Jordan River has cut through what's called an alluvial plain. There's lots of salts and sediments and then layers of, of sandy soil. And the river Jordan still to this day meanders back and forth. But there are great embankments that it still runs past. Did you know that in 1921, I think it is, perhaps 22, there was an earthquake in this region and it shook those loose sediments from straight up and down embankments and many of them fell into the Jordan, effectively making a series of dams and for about four hours, the entire Jordan River was a trickle. Just saying, just saying. So about this time, the walls and the archaeologists know that the foundations have shifted to the outward. And parts, perhaps all, but parts of the wall fell down. Remember those great embankments I was telling you about? The, the, uh, the, um, the uh, what's the embankment called? When you put stone against an embankment to keep it from shifting, it's called a retaining wall. A retaining wall. I said retaining wall like 10 times. Now I suddenly can't recall it. So the retaining wall, no way you're going to get up there. What if the mud bricks fall down across it? it would, they would form piles, and the piles could then be climbed up and over through the outer wall and through the inner wall, and the city could be taken. That's what the archaeologists have discovered. Hit our, neck, hit our go slide. We're going to zoom in on that wall. There's my window. I hit my go button. Uh, there they go, over the wall. And when the Bible says that uh, she lowered a scarlet thread, really a rope, that's where the two spies escaped. And now you know how that might look. Go ahead to our next slide. There is the circle at the bottom. You're looking north to south, I believe. And you'll see that is a portion of the outer uh, brick wall, the mud brick wall that was, that was uncovered in the 97 to 2000 excavation. See that serious trench that goes in? 
That's the Italian excavation. And they found, again, many of the pottery and those little scarabs I was telling you that uh, were pharaoh trading cards. And they know the exact time when that layer of burnt activity happened, just like the Bible said. Uh, Hit our go button. That is a part of the retaining wall that is still there. Still there. Hit our go button one last time, I think. When the Italian group got done excavating Jericho, they found many of these. These are clay jars that were found, but here's the key. They were full of grain all over. Now, remember, if you're an army and you're going to lay siege to a city, the people that are going to get sieged, they're going to try to prepare. And so they had a built-in spring that came up through that tell, so they had plenty of water. And remember, it was harvest time, says the Bible, so they had plenty of grains. And the siege of the Israelis against Jericho didn't last long. It lasted seven days, says the Bible. When they found jar after jar after jar after jar in Jericho, about the burned layer, they found that they were all full of grain, meaning it was harvest time, and if there was a siege, the siege, what, didn't last long at all. Seven days. Cool? Are all of you sufficiently geekified? Here's what I'm trying to say. If you get on the Wikipedia or many of these places or some of you going off to college here this next season... If, you're, if your professors are studied at all, they, they may bring up to you, you know, archaeology has proved that there was no city or fortress of Jericho at the time of Joshua. Please understand, they are citing the Kathleen Kenyon 1950s archaeology. Don't forget that in the year 2000, the Italians came in. It's always the Italians, right, Papa Sal? The Italians came in and they discovered with those scarabs and other archaeologies, all of these things, and they agree with the John Garsting 1930s assessment. Jericho was a prosperous, strong city, and they found rubble around all the areas that I talked to you about, except the northernmost section those walls stayed intact. So, all the other walls were mud brick and had worked their way down from the first wall, the second wall, and formed those ramps, as I said. Could have been seismic activity. But the note that they found, uh, that the Italians found, the northern end walls stayed intact. Why is that important? Because Joshua also says, hey, Rahab, when we come to take the city, you put a scarlet thread out the door, stay in your home, and you will not be destroyed. And I'm just saying, where was the sort of slum lord section of the city of Jericho? It was on the north. They found that out through the pottery shards. What was the only part of Jericho that the walls did not fall down? The north. I'll bet you 10,000 angel bucks that, or part of that, was Rahab's house. Exactly as the Bible describes. I'm just saying. Are you ready for our study now? Whoo, Steve, you are tough to listen to at times. Verse 1, chapter 19. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Highlight that if you wouldn't mind. Whenever the Bible makes a specific reference like this, there's always something to it. Jericho. Jericho. Yeah, that was the first of ten major cities that God's people conquered. By the way, the first tenth of anything goes or belongs to whom? God. So the first city, Jericho, God says to all the people, don't take any of the spoil. It's not yours. It's mine. Do you remember that there was one fella who did? If you know the story, Achan. When nobody was looking, he took some gold, some clothes, and he stuffed them under his coat or however it was, and he took them back to his tent, and he buried it where? Under his tent. He buried it in the ground. Do you remember the story? 
So Israel goes off to their next conquest, a small city named Ai, and then they get tatered. They get wiped out. Joshua says, what's up with that, Lord? I thought you were going to go before us. Well, we've got a problem. Somebody buried their blessing. Does that make sense? Then God calls them by tribe and by family and by clan, and finally the lot falls on Achan. Do you remember what happened to Achan? He was killed by fire. Don't bury God's blessing. Is that the lesson of Jericho? Look where we're at, verse one. And Jesus entered and passed through where? All right, now that we have Achan in our mind, verse two. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Everybody knows him. He's the short guy. Or no, we can't say short now, Mike. We gotta say vertically challenged. Yeah. Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was what? Rich. Do you remember last Sunday? Didn't we run into another rich guy? You remember that? And the rich guy came up to Jesus and he says, what do I lack? And Jesus says to him, well, go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. Why? He didn't say that to anybody else, to my knowledge. He said it to that guy. Why? That was that guy's button. That was his stronghold. If the creator of the heavens and the earth, who has zipped up a human suit, says to you, A, B, C, would you be inclined to want to do just that? He was a rich man, was the first rich fella. He was a son of Abraham. He was a Jewish person. He knew the Bible. He knew the signs of what Messiah, where would he be born, Bethlehem, all that he would do and say. Jesus is doing all that in front of him. He's a Jewish kid. He sees that Jesus is fulfilling every bit of Bible prophecy. That is the Messiah. I have a hunch that he was intellectually convinced. So he walks up to the Messiah and he says, what do I lack? Keep the commandments. Oh, I've done all that. Been to church all the time. I never miss a church service. Never miss a men's retreat. I never miss a men's breakfast. I'm always there. I have a community group and everything. Cool. What do I still lack? You got a button, young man. It's your money. God doesn't mind if you have money. He just minds if your money has you. Now notice he didn't try to run the kid down and say, no, let's get together and let me counsel you through this. Notice he didn't say that. Notice he didn't say, well, I know you don't see it right now, but next week we're going to have us a men's retreat. Surely the light bulb will go on then. Jesus didn't say, let's get you in an immersive discipleship program. How many of you would agree that Jesus was the greatest pastor, the greatest disciple who ever lived? Notice he didn't chase this kid. Why? Because he knew this kid would never believe him, Jesus, when he would say the hard things. He was a lost cause. He knew it. He didn't spend but maybe two sentences on this young man. We're running into another rich young man here, Zacchaeus. I want you to know something and pay close attention. Watch what happens. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Remember, Jericho is, uh, is huge. Um, I'll come back to that. Verse three, and he, Zacchaeus, because he was very rich, he was a tax guy, the chief tax collector in one of the richest provinces of the region. He was a really wealthy guy. And he, Zacchaeus, verse three, sought to see who Jesus was, just like that other rich guy, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short stature. So he, Zacchaeus, ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. Jesus. But for he, Jesus, was going to pass that way. Then when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw Zacchaeus and he said to him, Zacchaeus! How did Jesus know this guy's name was Zacchaeus? Now, he passed through this way perhaps often. Jericho was kind of the Vegas of the region, so I'm sure maybe he was by there. And if Zacchaeus was a honcho. Maybe he sort of knew him by reputation. He might. I don't know. But if he did know him by reputation, we're going to see that Zacchaeus was not only rich, he ripped off people in a merciless fashion. So even if Jesus knew Zacchaeus by reputation, would he have a high opinion of Zacchaeus? 
fascinating to me. Zacchaeus, me? Come down, for today I must stay. Greek word here is abide. I'm going to abide in your house. Harvest, can you see it? Put your Jesus glasses on. This is John chapter 15, verse 7. If I, Jesus, abide in you, and my, if you abide in me, pardon me, and if my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it will be done. Meaning, if you abide in me, and my words, God's words, abide in you, you will pray correctly. Not if I, in the Bible, 20 minutes, and then I pray whatever I want, and God's beholden to give it to me. No, if I am abiding in Jesus and his words are constantly washing my heart and mind, then the things that I pray are his will. Because you're quick to add to every prayer, not my will, but yours be done. This is John 15 stuff. I have to abide at your house. Verse six, so Zacchaeus made haste and came down and received him. I circled that in my Bible. This is when he gets saved. He received Jesus joyfully. The Greek word there is cheiron. It means literally rejoicing and breaking a sweat with great effort, great fervor. He's really, really happy. Remember the first rich guy? Does the Bible mention his name? No, interestingly enough. Did Jesus probably know him? My hunch is probably, because we sort of know who the honchos are in our community. He came up and said, what do I lack? Jesus told him, it's your riches. What did Zacchaeus say to draw the attention of Jesus? Nothing. Jesus saw him. There was a great bumper sticker uh, in the 80s, if you're a Christian, uh, I found it. How many of you remember that? Because the thing was, you know, somebody said, what'd you find? And you say, I found Jesus. And then you give them a witness. And I, I get that. But it's theologically not correct. We didn't find Jesus. He found me. Remember the first, first rich young ruler? Jesus. He had to ask, what do I lack? Zacchaeus doesn't say a thing. God calls him by his name. You have a heart that is repentant and that is teachable. Jesus didn't spend two seconds hardly with the first guy. He's going to spend all day at Zacchaeus' house. He's joyful, verse 7. But when they, I'm going to call this the thronging crowd, and if you'll pardon this Reference, the typical church service. Now remember, there is such a crowd going on here that Zacchaeus can't see over them. That's why he had to hike up the tree. It's not hard to, to gather a crowd. Uh, snappy enough music, talented people singing or orating. People love their ears to get tickled and they love to feel a sense of deep emotion. That's why we go to the movies. That's why we, we have a, a subscription to Netflix. I know you don't, Mike, but I do. I've got one. It's not hard to grow a crowd. Jesus was cruising through Jericho, and the crowd was significant. He spent no time with any of this crowd. He looked in on, locked on to whom? Zacchaeus. The tax collector guy, who, by the way, has been ripping us all off. The crowd, when they hear, we're going to spend all day at your house, Zach, here we come. The church service, a moment ago, jumping up and down, perhaps, yelling, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And Jesus didn't have the time of day for them because he knows that the crowd at large is not there for him. Well, wait a minute, they're saying his name. Think this one through. 
They're there because what they've heard about him. He's walking about, he's walking in and around miracles all the time. And I wonder if there weren't a bunch of people saying, I have a need, I have a need. In my little mind and imagination, I see this as not too unlike a church service. People come in, what you got for me, Jesus? I need this, I need that, I need this, I need that. Did Zacchaeus have a need or two? He didn't say a word. Help us to see this, Lord. Remember two weeks ago, we saw that of the 10 lepers who were, who were, who were um, miraculously healed, how many of them came back and worshiped? One in 10. I wonder if there's a similar ratio in practically any crowd. Yelling, Jesus, Jesus, tears streaming, Jesus, Jesus. But the moment that Jesus says to me, what about this? Oh, that's my button. Like the rich young ruler, why do I still lack? I've been going to church like crazy, keeping the commandments, doing all that stuff. Why do I still lack? Because you got a button, rich young ruler guy. And no matter what's coming out of my mouth, the creator of the heavens and the earth, you're not going to hear it. No matter how much time, no matter how immersive the discipleship program is, the, how thick the syllabus, no matter how many retreats you go to, no matter how many Sundays you attend, no matter how many women's ministries, men's ministry, community that the typical Laodicean church is selling, Get into a community. That'll fix you. With great respect. No, it won't. Even if Jesus himself were leading that retreat, even if it was Jesus himself taking you through a Beth Moore study, even if it's Jesus himself is it possible that I'm holding on to my button, my denial systems, my they did it to me and they did this and that and I deserve to stay broken. I deserve to hold and nurse a grudge. If Jesus himself put his hand on your button, if your heart is still self-focused, you won't hear him. Do you see this story with me? Remember the first rich guy? Why do I lack? Here's why you lack. There's your button. Oh, yeah, about that. Yeah, well, I'm not going to do that, Jesus. And off he goes. Did Jesus chase him? Because it wouldn't have done any, any good. He could have met with that young man every Tuesday at 1 o'clock and paid him $125 an hour. I'm going to say something that's going to be controversial, Harvest, but please try to hear it within the frame that I'm trying to communicate it in the midst of the story. I have spent countless hours over 40 plus years of ministry in marital counseling, in counseling of all kinds. I have tried my very best to do my due diligence to understand, does your backstory where you come from, does it affect, can it possibly affect and taint your current life? Absolutely. And I've tried for decades <clears throat> to see, to have people see it. And then when husbands and wives are on the sofa in my office, typically one's on one sofa, there's a middle sofa, I'll call that no man's land. And then there's the other, so the other sofa cushion. I can't tell you how many times, but here's my story. What they really want is to tell their story. I want to tell you why they're such a creep and why I have it so bad. I want you to see the story prayerfully with new eyes. There's nothing I can say. Even if Jesus himself were the counselor, if your heart is still locked on to your excuses, you won't see it. However, I have seen in a counseling session where one of the people went ding I'm a sinner here 
No wonder my spouse is having a, such a hard time with me. I did that. I am miserable to live with sometimes. I've seen that. Ding. I have sinned. Those are the marriages that turn around. Those are the marriages that see the miracle. Those are the marriages this close to the lawyers who today. I, can I get an amen from some of you who know what I'm talking about? Amen. Harvest, this is a powerful, powerful couple of stories. The rich young ruler in Jerusalem and this guy in Jericho. What do I lack? I could tell you, well, I did tell you, but you're not going to hear it. Zacchaeus, did he say anything about a need? No. And Jesus looked him up. You're the one. I know your heart. You are willing to become convicted. We're going to abide with you. Now watch what happens. Watch what happens. Verse 8. Then Zacchaeus stood and said, Lord, Lord, I give, did I read all that? Oh, verse 7, pardon me. But they, the thronging crowd, the large service, they saw it. You're going to hang with that guy? They all complained. The church service, the crowd at large, what are you doing? I don't get it. You're not acting anything at all like I thought you would. And because of that, ew. Because of that, ew. I can go down the street and get five counselors who'll spend years with me. So I get to tell my story. Oh, this is powerful harvest. Oh, they complain. He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner? Notice once again, Jesus is not impressed about or affected by the crowd. Two minutes ago, they were loving Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Two minutes ago, this was a raucous church service. Everybody was smiling, feeling good, part of a community, part of momentum. But they're not going to hear Jesus. And the second Jesus behaves nothing like they were expecting. Here comes the complaining. Ew. Who wants to go to a church that has a Zacchaeus in it? I wrote my margin. I am a Zacchaeus. Hope you guys know that. You're in a church, at least at this hour that you're with me. You are with the Zacchaeus. Self-centered, spending all of God's riches often on what I want. Wrestling the steering wheel from Jesus. Let me do the driving Jesus. By the way, and parenthetically, how far into the future can I see? So if this illustration is correct, I'm going to get the, the steering wheel from Jesus, but I better put on a blindfold because I don't know what's coming. Can you imagine being in a car and say, give me that steering wheel? And I put a blind spot on freeway. 80 miles an hour, baby. Woo! Jesus putting on his crash helmet. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. Oh, my, oh, my. And then when we crash, when, not if, when we crash, and cars upside down smoking the wheel, we're upside down because I flipped the car. Jesus looks over and I'm bleeding from the wounds of my terrible decisions. Jesus looks over upside down in his seatbelt as I am upside down in mine and he doesn't say, you are so stupid. Didn't I tell you this was gonna happen? What does Jesus do? He says, can I drive now? You know, yes. So we'll heal up from those wounds. We'll get back on that freeway. Why do I keep wanting to grab the steering wheel again? I am a Zacchaeus. And so are some of you in this room. Now verse 8. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, look, I give half of my goods to the poor. How rich was he? He was really rich. The first rich young ruler, God said, Jesus said, It's your riches, dude. Did Jesus have to say anything to this guy? Ding! My riches. I'm going to give away half. 
And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, if I ripped anybody off, I'm going to restore fourfold. This is huge harvest. Please write in your margin here, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 6. This is a Bible story. Fourfold? What are you talking about? 2 Samuel 12, verse 6 is where David had been messing with Bathsheba. They had a son. Nathan comes to his house and said, I'm going to tell you a really bad story. What's going on in your kingdom? Well, what's up, Nathan? Nathan is a model of God's word. There was a guy who had lots of sheep, and his next-door neighbor had one sheep. And the sheep was like a member of the family. Well, the, the rich guy, he had somebody come into town. He wanted to slaughter a sheep for a meal. But instead of gathering all of his sheep, for me, he has millions of them, he goes and gets the one guy's sheep and eats it. David's all, oh, that's awful! He will repay fourfold. Ah, who is this creep? And then Nathan, the word of God, you are the man. David, oh, I have sinned. Notice that the word of God pops into Zacchaeus' mind. The first rich young ruler, here's your button, dude. Yeah, I don't buy it. I'm, I'm out of here. Ew, following you that way. Zacchaeus didn't mention a thing, and Jesus didn't have to mention his button because pop, the word of God comes alive in his heart. <gasps> I'm like David. I will repay Fourfold. Notice Jesus didn't lead him through a discipleship program. He didn't get this at a retreat. He didn't get this at a men's study. He didn't get this in a community group. He had a heart. And when you abide in Christ and Jesus is abiding in you and your words and his words are abiding in your heart, ding! Then I get it. I feel like I'm not saying this well. Harvest, it doesn't matter if you go to a thousand retreats and have a wonderful time. If you're not right, if you're grabbing the steering wheel, and if you're holding on to your excuses because you know better, and you have blind spots, if Jesus himself were to point out what it was, you wouldn't believe him. Zacchaeus didn't come to this ding moment, this revelation, God's word popping alive in his heart and mind. And what did Jesus do? He didn't do a thing except just be with Zacchaeus. Hold your finger here. Would you make your way over to Romans chapter 12? I'm so far behind. I'm not sure if we're going to get done here today. Romans 12, please. Verse 1. You guys know this. If you wouldn't buy, would you turn there? If it's, if it's been a while since you've been there, let's look at it again. Remember this, the, 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 uh, the message this morning is entitled something along the lines of, I want to know what God wants for me. How do I know? How do I know? The Goliath that I'm facing is huge. By the way, the reason it is huge and possibly beyond your abilities at this moment is because God allowed it to be there. Why? Because you're like the rich young ruler. You won't see it. Until you see it. Here it is. I beseech you, harvest. Please, please, harvest. Chapter 12, Romans, verse 1. Please, harvest. By the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living what? What does a sacrifice do? He dies. And that's the funny thing about living sacrifices. See, real sacrifices, they're dead, they don't move. But when you're a living sacrifice, which means you got to do it a couple times a day, if you're not careful, you will wiggle right off the old altar. Stay put. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, meaning you could do this. Now watch, verse 2. And don't be conformed to this world, to the crowd, to the typical church stuff that is leading so many away in my opinion, because most pastors aren't teaching the Bible verse by verse. And there's one way that God's word comes alive in my heart. 
That's if I'm in God's word. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, there it is, by the renewing of your mind. Then you can prove, you'll know, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you want to know what God's will is? You can't be the first rich guy. You have to be a Zacchaeus. He is, you've got to abide in him. He's got to abide in you, and so does his words. Verse 8, one more time. Then Zacchaeus stood and said, Lord, look, I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor. There was his button, and Jesus didn't even have to say anything. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I'm going to restore it fourfold. That's 2 Samuel 12, verse 6. God's word came alive, verse 9. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Did the first rich guy, did he get saved? I don't think so. Even though Jesus told him plainly what his button is. Zacchaeus didn't, Zacchaeus came up with the own ding. You know, I had you turn back. Can you, go, can you join me in one more spot? Go to the book of Jeremiah, please. I want to show you something that if you didn't know is there, it's pretty important. Book of Jeremiah, please, chapter 31. By, uh, by the way, Wednesday night, how awesome is the book of Isaiah? We had a great time in Jeremiah. Are you in Jeremiah 31? Now watch this. Jeremiah 31. Look at verse 31 prophesying one day when God is going to save the world. Here's how he's going to do it. Verse 31. Chapter 31, Jeremiah, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 33. But this is the covenant. You should circle the and write in your margin there, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. Paul said that on the night Jesus was going to be betrayed, he took the cup, and of course we know that it's communion. He took the cup and Jesus said, this is the definite article, meaning there's only one of this one, the new covenant. What the disciples must have thought? What he was speaking of was this verse. When God was going to pay for everybody's sin and anyone who would receive that free gift, that finished work of the cross, then the Holy Spirit was going to live within them. And when the Holy Spirit, who is promised to lead you into all truth, to convict us of sin, what I shouldn't be doing, of righteousness, what I should be doing, and of judgment, watch this. When that day happens, the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, and I will put my law in their what? Minds. That's the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit one day. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will help us know what to do and write it on their what? Hearts. Now watch and pay close attention. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no more shall every man teach his neighbor. You don't need retreats, marriage counseling per se. I'm always open to help people. But you don't need men's groups, men's, women's groups. You don't need that. Look at this. Because if you're truly born again, God is writing his truth where? On your... And then Jesus would say, my sheep, they hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And it didn't require a retreat to get them there. Harvest, are you seeing this with me? Jesus demonstrated the rich young ruler, he had a button. He told him what his button was. He didn't hear it. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't buy it. Ew, I'm not hanging with you. Zacchaeus didn't say a word. Jesus knew what his button was, and Jesus didn't have to tell him, didn't have to counsel him. He didn't get it in a men's group. He got it because the word of God came alive, because he got saved. Remember, he received Jesus. Bing! What is that? 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 6. <gasps> That's 
that's me. That's why I have to repay fourfold. Harvest, do you see this? Let's go back to Luke, and I promise we're going to get done with this little section. I promise, I promise. Let's scoot to the end. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham, just like the first guy. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. That's what Zacchaeus did. Now as they, the disappointed crowd, as they heard these things, he, Jesus, spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. They were expecting all of the messianic stuff. Jesus was going to roll into town, kick out Romans, and begin the millennial reign. That's what they thought. Next week, remember this verse because when he shows up and they're singing the Hallel, the palm branches, and they're singing, you are the Messiah. Blessed is he, Messiah, who comes in the name of Jehovah God. You're a Messiah, dude. And Jesus stopped the whole parade and he what? Wept. They're not going to get it. They're not going to get it. And because of that, blindness in part is going to come to Israel and all that was going to happen. And he prophesied that in 38 years, the Romans are going to destroy Jerusalem. Now as they, the disappointed crowd, heard these things, he spoke another parable to them because, well, they're expecting some other stuff too. Uh, let me tell you about this kingdom of God. In this case, it would be the church, verse 12. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman, Jesus, went into a far country, Jesus left heaven, was born in Bethlehem, fulfilling messianic prophecies, messianic prophecies right in front of them. But they're not going to get it. Because he wanted to receive for himself the kingdom, born again, obedient people, filled with the Spirit, God's truth and direction written on their hearts. Anyway, he's going to return. Jesus, remember, goes back to heaven, but is he going to come back? Yes, in Revelation 19, verse 13. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas, and said to them, go ahead and do business until I come, really come back. But his citizens hated him. This is the Jewish people that are going to reject Jesus. When? In a couple of days. And sent a delegation against him saying, we will not have this man reign over us. Oh my, right in your margin, John 9, verse 15. That's what the whole crowd yelled. Shall I give you him or Barabbas? We will not have this man rule over us. Jesus is prophesying what is going to happen, verse 15. So it was that when he, Jesus, returned after the great tribulation, Revelation 19, having received his kingdom, Remember, when he comes back in Revelation 19, what's written on his thigh? King of kings and Lord of lords. Then he commanded those servants, these servants, to whom he had given the money. Remember in the, the um, parable of the talents, he gave 10, 5, and 1. Different people, meaning different spiritual giftings and ministries. What is he given in the amount of these minas? It's even across the board. It's a little different meaning than the talents. This is about salvation. Everybody has an equal opportunity to get saved. So to whom he had given the money to be called to him and that he, Jesus, might know how much every man had gained by the trading. This is a picture of judgment day. Verse 16. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned ten more. And he, Jesus, said to them, well done, good and, serve, good and faithful servant, because you were faithful in a very little and now have authority over ten cities. Speaking of the millennial reign, verse 18. Then the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five. Likewise, Jesus on judgment day said, good job. You can have authority over how many cities? Now it's a little different. Believe you me, Harvest, what we do under the sun with God's resources will affect what our job is in the millennial reign. But he's still saved. Now verse 20. Then another came saying, Master, here is your one mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. He buried it. What city is Jesus in? 
What was all of the spoil, all of the blessing? Who did it all belong to? The first of 10 cities, to God. Somebody took God's provision and blessings and did what with it? Buried it. That's what this guy's doing. That's why Jericho. Verse 21, for I feared you because you are an austere. The Greek word means unwavering. Yeah, that Jesus, you know, he kind of says what he says and then he doesn't waver. And that, that kind of bugs me. You collect what you personally did not deposit and reap what you personally did not sow. In other words, um, you're a good administrator. That's why you hire out this work. And so he's saying, and I know you're a tough guy to work for, so I just buried it. Baloney, I wrote in my Bible. Greek word, balonius. He didn't fear him at all. You know why he kept it and why he buried it? Because he didn't believe that the master was going to come back. And if the master doesn't come back, who does the, do the miners belong to? Well, if he had put it in a bank, it would have to have been under not his name, but his boss's name. Jesus is telling the story that the crowd by and large, those listening, we all have an equal opportunity to get saved. Some of you will. And because you, like Zacchaeus, God's word comes alive. You know what you got to do. You ask God for supernatural help to defeat your buttons. You live a spirit-filled life, love, joy, peace. By the way, you're ministering in power. The blind are seeing, the deaf are hearing, the lame and paralyzed are getting unstuck. And you recognize the demonic and take authority. Is that someone? You may want to hang with. And when you do, God's beautiful kingdom is irresistible. And other people around you get saved. But the one guy took all of God's blessings and he buried it. Verse 20. Here is your one mind of verse 21. I feared you. Now verse 22. And he, the master, said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an unwavering man, collecting what I do not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. That's what God's church is supposed to be doing. We're extensions of Jesus, verse 23. Why then did you not put my money in a bank that, it may, that at my coming it might have collected it with interest? God's gifts and talents if left unused. Oh my, verse 24, we're almost done. And he said to those who stood by, the crowd, the church service at large, take the miner from him and give it to him who has 10. Verse 25 now. But they said to him, Master, I think you might be a little crazy because he already has 10. Verse 26. For I say to you, most of the church going crowd, to everyone who has, they believed Jesus, they repented of sin, they got saved, they're moving in ministry and giftings and finances and giving it to God. God is going to give them what? More. You cannot give God harvest, whether it's your time, your giftings, or your finances. God says, I'm gonna give you more back. We'll be given, and from him who does not have, those who did not believe Jesus, didn't repent, spent all of God's time, giftings, and resources on whom? On themselves. He, even, even what he has, will be taken away from him. Let's all stand. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Lord, this is one of those messages, I pray that this servant can sort of get out of the way. Lord, let your Bible speak powerfully and profoundly. We've had two blessed people. Both of them had a, a nagging suspicion that they were lacking something. And when Jesus said to the first guy, here's your button, dude, the guy folded. I'm not going to do that, Jesus. Notice, didn't, Jesus didn't spend two seconds with him because he knew it wouldn't matter. Harvest, there's too many people in the church that are coming to a service like this, kind of with the idea, well, what you got for me, pastor? 
Where's my programs? Where's my retreats? Where's my men's study? Where is my women's study? Do we see in stark focus that if I had not the right heart, even if Jesus Christ himself were giving the message at that retreat, that women's study, you might not even see it and go on in your Christian culture and go to retreat after retreat and still you're bugged about your spouse. You're bugged about that person. You're triangulating. You're pulling down one person to make you look better. And it doesn't even really seem to bother you. And God forbid if someone were ever to point it out. And then much of the crowd says, ooh, who wants to go to that church? Zacchaeus is there. Everybody's head down and eyes closed. Do you know the Lord Jesus? Have you been born again? Intellectually, it's as easy as God zipped up a human suit and paid for all of my sin. But with your heart, have you actually given your whole life to him? Have you given him the steering wheel? Have you asked him to save you? Like Zacchaeus, you've asked him to come into your house and him abiding in you. He doesn't necessarily have to say a thing. Bing! Bible verses come alive. Bing! My excuses of why I get to stay broken fall. Bing! I'm the one making this marriage miserable for my spouse. I'm the one sowing seeds of discord among the brethren. And 10 pastors couldn't disciple that out of me because I haven't truly, truly given my whole life to him. This morning, Lord Jesus, I do that. Saved or not saved? Are you the first rich young ruler that even if Jesus told you what your button was, you're not going to believe it? And 10 pastors couldn't tell you either. And 50 retreats won't beat that out of you. It has to come from being born again, spirit-filled, and the word of God coming alive. That's what transform. Please harvest. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Completely. Don't be conformed to the Laodicean church, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you're going to know what to do. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you. If you like some prayer, come up to the front. I'm not going to come up after what you said, Pastor. See you on Tuesday, everybody.